Um, so if you don't turn off your camera, uh, if you don't turn off, uh, or if you don't turn on, on your camera, you shouldn't pop into the recording. Um, Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, so this is the first of a series that we are so excited um, to be sharing to bring together just brilliant folks who are working uh, at the intersection of sex work, technology, history, and really contextualizing this current moment. Um, so today we have with us uh, to open the series off two really brilliant and amazing uh, folks who work on these issues from a pretty unique perspective. Um, so just to get us off, uh, started, um, Hacking Hustling, who's presenting the series, is a collective of sex workers, survivors, and accomplices working at the intersection of tech and social justice to interrupt state surveillance and violence faced by technology. So our agenda today, we're going to start um, and then, of course, community agreements, because this is all facilitated, of course, by community organizers, um, and share a little bit about what we're talking about this month and how we kind of uh, are trying to set the stage for this conversation. Um, from there, we'll give a little bit of background just to contextualize the conversation. Then we're going to switch over to our brilliant experts um, and then open it up to some uh, questions and answers. And then at 1.30 Eastern, 10.30 Pacific, um, we're going to turn off the recording and switch it to really an open conversation where we just kind of invite people to debrief and talk about, uh, you know, anything that might have come up that you wanted space to talk about um, in a different format. And so we're going to have about a half hour for that. And once again, that will not be recorded. Um, we can't promise us, we can't guarantee a safe space, but we do our best to make it um, safer and more comfortable for folks. And so are reserving that time at the end really specifically for that. So these are uh, our community agreements. Um, bring, first off, bring in your histories and please speak from your own experience. All of our experiences are unique. They are where we uh, locate so much of our expertise and they are very much our own. Second, be committed to each other's collective learning and growing. Both we invite people to share more information and we also recognize that we all have a learning curve that is um, personal and complicated and very valuable when we are committed to moving along it. Be open to learning. Um, different experiences are held differently for everyone and we welcome all of those unique and diverse experiences. Um, we request to not share pirated work, including books, pornography, or any other art firm form. Um, while we want to share as much information as possible, we also are a community that's very used to having uh, our productions replicated without consent. And so um, we are going to be sharing links to things that are publicly available, and we invite more work. And uh, if there is something that is not publicly available, um, please don't share it uh, without the author's express permission. Um, next, we respect the diversity of our identities, which particularly for the purposes of this conversation means not assuming the identities of either organizers or activists who we're, who, for whom uh, we are sharing this space. Um, we don't assume anything about anyone's lived experience just by participating here. Um, and we encourage people to disclose only as much as they feel comfortable doing and uh, hope that we are crafting a space where people will not feel pressured um, to disclose information that, that might not feel comfortable. Um, we practice care for ourselves and for each other. Um, if you need to get up, if you need to stretch, if you need to uh, do what you need um, to feel comfortable in the space, we absolutely welcome that. Um, we cherish self-care, we honor our bodies and our spirits, um, and we uh, hope to encourage others to do we practice not using ableist language um, and uh, we can try to put the link to ableist language in the chat to understand more of what that means, but we recognize ableism manifests um, against both uh, uh, bodies experiencing disabilities, but also neurodivergence. Um, and mostly we just want to recognize that we're all on a journey towards collective liberation and we move there holistically and we move there together. Um, and so we ask uh, all of you to take care of yourselves um, and to support us and to uh, in caring for each other. Um, so our uh, amazing presenters that we have here today um, are uh, Gretchen Sutherland. So just to give a, a quick background, and then I invite both of them to feel free to share what's useful. Um, Gretchen Sutherland is an associate professor of media history at the University of Oregon School of Journalism and Communication. She's the author of Sex Trafficking, Scandal, and the Transformation of Journalism, 1885 to 1917, and the editor of Charting, Tracking, and Mapping, New Technologies, Labor, and Surveillance, a special 
crucial issue of social semiotics. Her articles have appeared in such journals as American Quarterly, Feminist Formations, The Communications Review, Humanity, and Critical Studies in Media Communication. Uh, Mei Zhang also uses she, her pronouns. Um, Mei Zhang is a Vanity Fair reporter. She is at work on a book about sex work and how it intersects with the criminal justice system. Um, and to introduce myself, I'm gonna be moderating this conversation and just sharing a little bit of context and background. Um, my name is Kate Diadamo, I use she, they pronouns. Um, I work with Reframe Health and Justice, which is a, a, a queer and trans people of color collective, uh, which works at the intersection of harm reduction, healing justice, and upending criminal legal uh, structure. My background is community organizing. Now I came up as a swap New York City organizer. Um, I organize in here in Baltimore on Piscataway land uh, currently, and I work on policy and advocacy at the local, state, and federal level. Um, and I'm so grateful for this conversation and uh, for all of you that are here. So first and foremost, what we wanted to do was really landscape a conversation. Um, and this came out of a lot of uh, uh, discussions about kind of the current moment that we're in. Um, and so, you know, in discussing FOSTA SESTA, in discussing OnlyFans, in discussing, you know, the internet as it's happening, it, what we keep kind of coming across and what we kept coming across was this very specific um, experience over and over and over again. And that is that uh, sex workers historically have inhabited new spaces. Sex workers have been early adopters, um, reaching into either new physical spaces, new digital spaces, new forms of technology, new forms of communication and advertising. And then what happens is we move into these new spaces, we make them habitable, we make them accessible, we make them desirable to be in because you have to attract people. And then when that space becomes attractive, sex workers are ultimately regulated and gentrified and criminalized out of those spaces. And while we were seeing this happen on different websites, on Tumblr, on every new technology that we were existing in, in every neighborhood that we were existing in, we wanted to locate this conversation of what's happening today and really put it in a longer term context to know that this isn't new, to know that this isn't the first time that this is happening. And when we started really digging in, um, it really began with the United States. It began with the history of the United States under this lens. And so what we wanted to do was craft a conversation that brought people together to talk about this thesis, to talk about this idea. Um, and so what we're doing is we are starting today uh, in the early 1800s and talking about technology, talking about sex workers, and then talking about regulation um, and moving from there. So just to, uh, and so what we're gonna be doing over the rest of this month is we're starting here. Um, next week, we're gonna ta be talking about things like, you know, back pages and magazines, looking at kind of mid-century 1950s obscenity. Um, then we we'll move into the early internet. Uh, so way back when we had message boards and everyone was at Yahoo and AOL email addresses. And then we're gonna finish out the month really talking about the current moment that we're in um, and the last couple of years of what digital gentrification has looked like. And so just to set the stage for today's conversation, that's kind of where we're coming from. So to kind of ground us in this moment, if this adorable map background doesn't help. Um, so what we're gonna be talking about really begins in a couple different contexts. First and foremost, the context of movement and how that really is shaping what a new frontier even means. Um, the context of technology, how technology is both facilitating this movement and also becoming relevant in different ways because movement means changing communities. It means we interact in different ways. And then of course, what happens after those items is the context of social upheaval. How was our society changing? And what was the role sex workers were playing in there? So first of all, we're talking about 1820s and movement. We're talking about um, westward expansion a lot of times. So the idea of manifest destiny, the idea that the United States should colonize the Americas that we had the right to, um, was really, uh, uh, it, it was officially you know, 1845, but it was this idea of colonization that was really taking root. The gold rush really facilitated that. Um, and I know our other speakers are gonna speak to this. So this is just a kind of, set the stage. Um, and by the 1870s, we're really talking about the railroad facilitating both the railroad as a form of industry, but also as a form of movement. And one of the other things that we have to talk about is that, you know, while sex workers were making these spaces desirable, they were also cementing colonization. 
And so as we're moving into these new spaces into the West, you're talking about this really being predicated on the extermination of First Nations folks and Indigenous communities and really making sure that that became permanent when those new settlements turned into permanent places. And so while we talk about this, we also really want to invite people to think about those legacies of colonization of the racialized nature of so much of who was a laborer and who was not, who had access to what and who did not. Um, and we can't pretend that sex workers were not a part and a very integral part of making sure that colonization was um, not just this immediate tragedy and horror, but really a permanent experience that foregrounded expansion. Um, another form of movement that was really important was urbanization. So we are also looking at um, people moving from rural areas from more agriculturally grounded communities into because of the growth of new economies of new industries of new jobs, people moving out of rural areas and moving into cities. And so over these years, we're also seeing expansion of the size of cities um, and a real shift in what that meant for who could get a job. Of course, international migration was also changing. So this is coming on the legacy of not just colonization, but globalization. Um, during uh, 1903 to 1905, which is gonna be an important period um, in this conversation, we're talking about the highest peaks at Angel Island and you're talking about different racial demographics. So prior you were seeing predominantly um, Western European Nordic uh, countries. Um, being the the most of the immigrants that were coming over. You were also talking about that that in this period shifting to Eastern and Southern uh, Europe and also Asian migration really um, increasing at the time. And of course, this leads to social upheaval. When you have, you know, all of these changes happening, when you have a country still forming, um, you're really talking about uh, the crafting and the creation of really ingrained um, racialization and racial hierarchy became much more stagnant. Um, after chattel slavery, you were you had to really cement what a white identity was. Um, the Invention of Whiteness is a really amazing book uh, that talks about this lineage. And then moving chattel slavery dynamics into debt bondage, into convict leasing as a new form of uh, racialized exploitation. Colonization also contributed to this, um, creating this narrative of erasure of First Nation communities um, and really demonizing the idea of especially men from First Nation spaces and from indigenous uh, areas. And then of course, the changes in international migration. And I specifically broke this into uh, three pieces, um, borrowing from the incredible work of uh, the three pillars of heteropatriarchal whiteness um, and organizing in uh, women of color communities. And it's a brilliant essay that really breaks down uh, how racialization happens along these three prongs in the United States specifically. Um, this dynamic also really for, was uh, integral to looking at the change in the role of women over this period and the change of, and the role of women really changing the structure of families. Industrialization provided brand new opportunities for women to, even if you're talking about meager wages, being not the unpaid laborer on a farm because you were the second daughter. Um, and so because a lot of families, even capitalism to this day, really relies on unpaid female labor, we're talking about losing that labor and all of a sudden losing what a family dynamic meant in a lot of traditional ways. Um, and so uh, industrialization, the movement to urbanized spaces, really shifting that. Um, changes in social dynamics. We're talking about the rise of the temperance movement, which was very deeply tied to uh, the, the suffragette movement um, and temperance being not just against uh, sex and the sex industry, but also temperance movement around alcohol, which are two very paired relationships. Um, movement and changing social dynamics also means growing fears of interracial relationships, which foregrounds a lot of anti-prostitution law. When you talk, when you look at what a lot of the fears were articulated as, it was both the idea that um, if there were white women in uh, sex work, they would become more accessible to men of color and especially men of color who were migrants who had capital because they were in these new industries. Um, and that really uh, became a growing and oppressing fear. And then of course, um, and I know uh, Gretchen's gonna talk a lot about this, um, new media really shifting and, and media really shaping what cultural narratives look like and how fast they were moving. And of course, new technology, um, which you know uh, marries a lot of this stuff together and is both kind of the impetus and the result. Um, so 
new technology in terms of, of physical uh, movement. So looking at trains, looking at ships, looking at the early, early automobiles and how that is shifting um, some, and facilitating these dynamics. Um, information technology, so things like mass media, the way that newspapers um, told their stories and were sold. But of course, mass media means more accessible media. Um, entertainment being uh, always a part of this. Um, when we talk about information technology, you know, sometimes that's things that we call news and sometimes that's things we call social narratives. Um, and the, the relationship of changing entertainment, the way we told stories changed um, and facilitated just emotion, different emotional reactions from those stories. Um, and finally, economically, mechanized agriculture, looking at industrialization um, and having those new technologies create new jobs, create new forms of industry um, and, and really shift a lot of social dynamics. And forms of sex work at the time were really responsive to this. Um, oops. Uh, so, of course, there's uh, always been street-based workers, workers who, who move in public space, who advertise and identify clients in publicly-based spaces. Um, around especially urbanization, there was um, something, basically, when I read this, I was like, oh, so you mean the first sugar babies. So when urbanization was really uh, created, you were talking about um, younger women who may or may not have even been the age of being traditionally married, um, but who were in low paying jobs and who lived uh, some, sometimes independently with each other, sometimes still living with families. And so how did you go out and enjoy yourself if you're, you know, I, you have just enough money to get by, but maybe you wanna, you know, go to Coney Island. Maybe you wanna partake in movies. Maybe you wanna do this, uh, have a different kind of lifestyle and have fun. And the way to do that was to engage in um, economically based, but kind of pseudo romantic GFE relationships with men who are willing to pay for those things. And so that was called treating, they were called charity girls. Um, and, and it was really frequent. And um, there's some really great books uh, uh, about this um, specifically that are really fascinating. Um, there were of course brothel based workers um, that was legalized in many locations. It was very racialized and, and uh, brothel based work was also something that was um, generally run by women in a lot of places. Um, so most brothels were actually run really specifically uh, by women who had worked in the industry for a long time. Um, and actually the very first, uh, as far as I've found thus far, and please, if you have other information, um, the first on the books law that I was actually able to find that was really specifically about uh, prostitution regulation was in 1857, and it was about brothels. And it was really specifically saying like, we know they're here, but could you not put them on the first floor of the building because of windows? Um, and so brothel based work was a lot of how people understood sex work at the time. And then, of course, uh, burlesque and other um, kind of dancing around vaudeville, around with a kind of married and operated, as it still often does, in that kind of gray space. Um, and now I'm going to shift it to uh, Mei Zhang, um, who is our first speaker. And uh, I'm so excited and so grateful to both of you for being here um, and so excited to learn. Uh, so I will. This is where we all uh, practice our seeing how we're doing with technology. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Great, thank you so, so much. Um, let's see if this works. Uh, t -t 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 -t. This should be, did that work? Yep. Okay, terrific. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm just making note of time so I can uh, and on time. Um, I Today I'm going to be talking about, mostly about Atoy, who is the first recorded um, Chinese prostitute of the gold rush in California. Um, so we'll begin the story, um, I guess, in the early 1800s, early to late, or sorry, mid to late, pardon me. And But I just wanted to mention, contextualize my own interest in Atoy, which was that I was sent down to Florida in 2019 to write about a series of um, massage parlor raids that happened. And this is, you know, routine occurrence, as we you know, sadly all know. But this particular ra a series of raids um, only really rose to um, national and at times global uh, attention because one of the Johns was a billionaire, Robert Kraft, he owns the New England Patriots, a football team, and um, that's really the only reason why uh, we're talking about it. I mean, it, in Florida especially, there are these raids happening all the time, and what I was uh, rather struck by was, I mean, as is the case with all vice raids, 
um, many vice raids, pardon me, the women, um, you know, lost their livelihoods. Um, they obviously, you know, there was a lot of shame introduced into uh, personal dynamics. I mean, I'm in touch with a few of them still, and, you know, they've had since then falling outs with family members. Um, they were not able to um, uh, communicate with other workers, um, court ordered, uh, you know, gag and so then you know they are also losing support networks and in two instances the women were undocumented and subsequently were handed over to um, ice custody and so just terrible fallout and what was so striking was that this in, and then since then the interrogation tapes uh, were leaked and in these interrogation tapes we see the sheriffs and the cops sort of you know interrogating the the work uh, workers you know asking them you know are you you know have you been you know sex trafficked and they keep saying no and it just really amazed me that people are are you know more readily believing of a global um multi-million dollar sex trafficking conspiracy over the fact that you know people want to live and they'll do whatever they need to to make a living um, and make choices in their lives. And so while working on this story, I remember thinking, well, but, you know, why is it that, you know, so many massage parlors are uh, run by um, Asian women and also when did this begin? And so um, I asked myself this question, which led me to um, the next slide, uh, California Gold Rush. So California Gold Rush happens, you know, begins officially in 1848. And this sort of, you know, economic opportunity, uh, the news of economic opportunity travels um, to the East. And this is when, you know, uh, workers began to come over. And among the people who came uh, was a woman named Atoy. There are no photos of Atoy, and the few uh, details that we know about her, we know only because she uh, took Johns to court, which I'll talk about later. And I think this is, you know, what is driving a lot of my personal work, realizing that um, uh, actually the records that do exist are records of, you know, victors and, um, the white capitalist class. And I think it's such a shame that we don't know more about Atoy than, than we do now. And I want to make sure that, you know, Atoy's of 2021 are being, you know, their lives are being recorded um, and uh, archived uh, for posterity. So Atoy, uh, she comes um, in the, she's actually the second woman to come to San Francisco, and I believe the third to come uh, in America. What's rather telling is that the very first woman who comes to, Chinese woman who comes to America, um, actually came as a kind of curio, um, as part of a circus. She was brought over by a white man, and people would pay like a couple cents to go and, you know, regard this sort of exotic, you know, um, uh, character. And Atoy um, comes, you know, there are the sort of these conflicting accounts of, you know, maybe she had a husband, but maybe the husband died at sea. She, you know, maybe seduces the captain who sort of, you know, helps her set up. And eventually she ends up setting up shop on Clay and Kearney, uh, which is now, you know, modern day Chinatown. And the thing that I find rather interesting is that that area, you know, then, you know, grows on to become the red light district. But the reason why um, it was, uh, it had this sort of, you know, stat, uh, yeah, status of a, uh, a morally suspect district is because of the fact that men and women of different races and classes would intermingle, not necessarily because there was so much um, prostitution and um, gambling and, you know, things that we traditionally understand to be, uh, of, you know, vice businesses. And so she sets up shop and, you know, starts working. Um, and within five years, she becomes an incredibly prominent madam. Um, and what's interesting, which I'll mention, you know, talk about later as well, is that she is obviously, she's the only Chinese woman at the time. And then, you know, afterwards, more people arrive and she starts hiring them. But she's really sort of playing off of the fact that there's a lot of like white male gaze on her and she is, you know, being orientalized. And she actually sort of bends that to her advantage by um, making use of the fact that, you know, uh, people are coming to her for, uh, um, clients are coming to her for like a very particular um, experience. And um, the other thing I should also mention is that um, one of the reasons why I became quite interested in this era is that 
uh, I, in 2019, I was very struck by the fact that a lot of like anti-immigration legislation effectively ends up becoming anti-prostitution legislation. Um, and then as we'll see later, um, this is you know effectively what happens with the, um, the, the PAGE Act, which is the very first um, immigration related uh, legislation that specifically targets um, not even, yeah, Asian women, but specifically Chinese women. And this is actually the thing that becomes a precursor to the Chinese Exclusion Act, which we'll get into um, later. And so, yeah, so the first technology was immigration systems, people making use of um, immigration policies or the lack thereof to, you know, um, expand into new frontiers. Um, the second technology I want to talk about technology is um, the court system. So again, as I mentioned earlier, the reason why we even know about um, Atoy is because she um, took Johns to court. Uh, and, and the reason why she was able to do this is because Atoy existed at a time, this sort of, um, uh, like not pre-lapsarian, I don't think that's the right word, but you know, she, she arrived in America at a time before xenophobia and racism and sexism and horophobia could be like codified into law. And so as an example, Timothy Dwight Hunt's first clergyman of the Bay Area, area um, he, he's first to arrive in October, 1848. So this is after Atoy. And so um, we, so Atoy yeah, comes at this like interstitial time where she's able to actually um, exert her rights as a woman without being um, uh, ridiculed or uh, stymied. Um, again, yeah, so the third technology I have to talk about is Orientalism. She's sort of, you know, very uh, exoticized, but then is actually able to um, make use of that. And this is something that um, I've been thinking about a lot, you know, after the Atlanta massacre as well. You know, why is it that, because if you go to China or Korea or Japan, it's not like all women aren't sexualized there in the way it is here. And so then one, one asks the question of, you know, where do these stereotypes come from? And a lot of the, um, uh, ideas that we live with today actually have its roots in um, uh, policy and, and, and law. And so for example, um, because immigration was so restricted, um, Chinese men weren't able to create families, which paradoxically you know, increased demand for prostitution. And as well, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, sort of, um, what's the word? stereotype of you know the asian male being very emasculated why is that because you know when when asian men first came into this country to work they were actually barred from um uh working in traditionally sort of you know heteromasculine spaces and so they were relegated into feminized labor which is you know whatever laundry um the running laundromats or running restaurants. And likewise with women, because of the restrictions that existed in, in immigration policies, um, the very first, many of the first initial wave of women who came were um, in fact prostitutes. And this is again later replicated in the ways in which after the Korean War, uh, I mean, there was one year where some insane number, like nine out of 10 Korean, uh, Koreans who came to America, this is pre-1965, uh, were war brides. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll get more into that later. But anyways, um, so Atari, she goes to court, again, you know, making use of the fact that people are hoodwinked by her. She sort of has this like very dramatic presentation. Um, there are multiple records of her being the finest looking woman I've ever met. And then there's this, um, uh, also this slightly unfortunate um, account from a, a man who was enamored by her saying, you know, Chinese are usually ugly, women as well as the men. There are a few girls who are attractive, if not actually pretty, for example, the strangely alluring Atoy. And so this is the thing that she um, uh, made use of, which I think is actually rather exciting. And, but also around this time, you know, immigration as we know happens as a result of push and fill factors. Um, the pull factors, of course, in this potential for riches, filthy lucre, and then the pull factor is that there is just um, uh, just unending series of civil wars in China um, during colonial time, opium wars, and so then you know there are more um, Chinese coming in, um, immigrants, and 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 then we start to see. Um, uh, institutions and systems react to this. And so this is when we begin to see things like the Foreign uh, Minors Act, which you know specifically targeted 
foreigners, but also specifically the Chinese um, community, um, they would tax them. And then we also start seeing things like cubic air act, cyborg ordinance, Q ordinance. Um, and these were never explicitly targeting, you know, you, I, I haven't found any literature that specifically says, you know, the Chinese will be targeted or what have you, but um, effectively ends up becoming an anti-Chinese um, series of ordinances, which again, of course, we see reflected um, in modern times with um, walking wild trans ban or, um, you know, the, I always get this confused, um, lawyer during with the intent to solicit, again, it doesn't explicitly in the letter of the law target, you know, the trans community or gender non-binary people or poor people or people living in, you know, not yet gentrifying spaces, but it effectively ends up, you know, targeting people who are already marginalized. And, um, and then, so the, the culmination of this sort of crescendoing sense of xenophobia is this thing called the San Francisco uh, Committee of Vigilance. And this was uh, one of the very first sort of vice units that uh, started up in the Bay Area. They were, you know, um, I forget, I think something like, you know, Protestant born native men uh, elected themselves into this committee and started, you know, fighting vice. And there was this one guy, John A. Clark, sorry, um, who, ooh, oh, yeah, John A. Clark, who was the daughter of like a mayor of New York City, who um, appoints himself to, you know, fight prostitution specifically. And he decides that, okay, the thing to do is I'm going to take down Atari. She's like this like, public face, a public face of um, prostitution in the Bay Area. And I'm going to take her down and that's going to whatever. Um, uh, that will be great for me. And so he he sets out to do this and actually in the process, um, Atuai seduces him and uh, he falls for her and um, that the, that's the end of that. Um, and then the other curious thing about around this time is that uh, similar to what happened in the progressive era, there's a lot of rhetoric around, you know, conflating, um, I'm so sorry, this is Brooklyn, um, conflating, there's also construction kitty corner from me, conflating um, uh, foreigners with diseases. And that is obviously what we've been seeing for the past year as well. Um, it is, I think I've decided that actually it is human nature to want to whenever we want to deflect, when something terrible happens, we want to deflect blame. And the easiest person to deflect blame upon are usually, you know, the, the weakest link or the latest to arrive or, or, or someone we consider to be weak. And that is has happened over and over and over again. Um, I mean, we see this with, um, uh, you know, during the plague, for example, um, I think I forget, like 1700s or something um, in, uh, it was decided that it was actually, you know, the, the Jews were, you know, the culprit and then that led to like a massive pogrom and, you know, this is something that we see um, over time. There's like a movie, 1950s movie called Panic in the Streets, a Kazan movie, and there's a plague that happened in the movie as well. And the community, community that is demonized there is like the Turks, which is, you know, um, at the time in Hollywood were like a stand-in for like the outsider. And so again, I, I think a lot of the stuff that we're talking about today, it finds its echoes elsewhere, um, which is uh, something to know. And so Donald and Cameron was a, a white missionary woman, Victorian. Um, and what's really telling is that so Atoy survives like xenophobia, Johnny Clark actually ends up becoming a, a surprise. He was an abuser, so she's, she's a domestic violence survivor. She comes into a country where she doesn't know anybody, doesn't speak the language, no connections, makes a life for herself. But the thing that takes her down is uh, white women, the white women savior class. And so Donald and Cameron um, is the most famous among uh, a, a whole sort of a, a class of women who came in saying, we need to, you know, protect these, you know, Chinese women, we need to, we need to, um, save them. And there are multiple accounts of, you know, these white women coming in and then rescuing um, Chinese women, sending them to like work camps to purify themselves. And then the Chinese women run away. And it's not to negate that the fact that they, yes, I'm sure, I mean, not I'm sure, but their records do say that, you know, there was trafficking, but the, the answer is, is never going to be um, uh, rescue. It's like rights, over rescue, right? And so you, you, you rescue them, but then you're, you're taking them out, of, out, you know, extricating them from situations that are harmful, but also situations that actually, um, you know, offer community. And so the only way in which the, the, the few Chinese women who sort of, you know, were rescued and 
whatever actually ended up the, the cost of that was that they had to completely um, abandon their Chinese identity and became like very westernized and you know converted and that was the way that was the only way in which they, they could exist in these like in white spaces um, and then uh, yes so Page Act and the Chinese Exclusion Act we spoke about um, Atoy actually retired happily uh, in San Jose and she died three months before her uh, 100th birthday. You'll be happy to know. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the Korean War brides, you know, are also women, a group of people who come after the war and they, again, I think it's, it's, it's not correct to conflate, you know, it's not like all Korean War brides were prostitutes, but the, the most common ways in which um, women at that time would even be able to encounter a GI would be in, in camp towns um, where they would be working as like bar girls or hostesses or et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and, and the really devastating thing about the Korean War brides is that they, so as I mentioned, they make up a, a very significant percentage of people who come to America. They sponsor, um, so they're, you know, they're you know, at the frontiers or um, uh, exploring a new land. They sponsor family members at times multiple generations of them the family members come and then they shun uh the war brides who brought them here because of the shame associated with like interracial marriage or you know you know histories of prostitution or what have you and i find that very devastating obviously um and, and this sort of links us to the final um uh slide which is the atlanta massacre of march 16th uh this year where eight people die and six of them Asian women. One of them was a, uh, a, a modern day Korean war bride. She met her partner um, who was a GI in Korea and then moved to, and, and then her partner was, her husband was um, assigned to Fort Bragg, which is in Georgia, which is how she ended up in the Atlanta area in the first place. Um, and so, yeah, that concludes my swift run through the slides. I also just wanted to mention Red Canary Song, who's um, I think maybe perhaps some, some of you may know, I'm not sure, but they work they work in organizing um, the massage parlor communities. They do really good work and uh, you can check out their work um, on the website. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. My, oh, you went over so many fascinating and really amazing um, issues that still hold so much resonance. And I think I love that context um, to uh, of just providing the way that, you know, this has been not only so much of uh, our collective history, but also, you know, uh, um, and as came up in the chat, really um, invites us to look at our own personal legacies in the ways that um, uh, we carry these generational stories with us, even even personally. Um, and so now I'd love to uh, shift over to Gretchen um, as we continue to play with technology and cross our fingers for things since it's the first one. Yeah. Oops. Oh. All right. Am I up? on everyone's screen. Looks great. All right, thank you so much, May. And I also wanted to, oh, well, let me set the timer so I don't run over. Okay. Um, I also wanted to thank the organizers of the event. Um, it's so great to be here with sex worker, activists, scholars, and allies. And, um, and it's just really great to um, be able to share ideas and learn from one another. So as Kate mentioned, um, my background is in uh, media. And so, and part of when, you know, when we think about media, we're also thinking about communication technologies. So, and other, and, and the ways in which technologies that we might not recognize as communication technologies, in fact, are about, are forms of media. So um, technologically speaking, uh, the 19th century really set the stage for the present day in a lot of ways. The 19th century saw um, the rise of the steam and then the electric uh, printing presses that could reproduce texts uh, more rapidly and in higher quantity than ever before. Um, the telegraph was invented in the 1840s and for the first time ever, 
uh, information didn't have to physically be carried from place to place. Um, uh, the telegraph also laid the groundwork for um, a lot of the communication technologies that we have today, including the internet. And so, um, but by 1900, uh, you've got electric lights, uh, you've got cameras that can freeze time and, uh, and capture lifelike images of real people, real places, real events. Um, you've got moving pictures, gramophones, Te uh, telephones, uh, you have electric trolleys in, in various cities, and you even have you know, devices like x-rays. So how did sex work and sex workers fit into this changing technological landscape? Well, just like many other forms of work, right? Uh, sex work adapts to and it exploits changing technologies. And of course, as uh, Kate pointed out, um, sex workers have historically been early adopters um, and also innovators in technological spheres. Um, they've experimented with and thought about um, new commercial uses for technologies, and they did so very early on. And since I study media, I'm going to talk about two areas where sex work and communication technologies intersected in the 19th and early 20th centuries. I'm going to talk about newspapers and payment uh, technologies. And I'm going to make the case a little bit later in my talk that payment is actually a form of, communi of communication and, uh, and a form of media. Um, and in some cases in the 19th century, sex workers were innovators. But in other cases, innovation occurred around the topic of sex work. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, perhaps like peculiarly 19th century dynamic. I'm not quite sure. Um, and I want to show how even though sex workers saw possibilities that were inherent in technology, um, organized campaigns against the sex trade um, and the way that these campaigns got expressed in film and documentary and newspapers, um, they often turned this fact on its head, right? And instead they depicted technologies being foisted on sex workers, right? Or used to manipulate and entrap gullible uh, and tech, tech ignorant sex workers. Um, these representations in popular culture right, were then used to justify increased policing of both sex work and technology. And then that's a dynamic that I think really intensifies um, in the 20th century and then, of course, in, into the 21st century. Okay, so newspapers and print media. Uh, the print media in the US and in other places as well um, engaged issues of commercial sex throughout the 19th century. Um, in the US, you could argue that the commercial advertising driven press developed in tandem with the sexual content that it contained. And a lot of that sexual content was actually about sex work. So stories about prostitution were at the heart of, of major innovations in reporting. One example is uh, in the 1830s, serial, when serialized news coverage emerged around the murder of an upscale New York City uh, prostitute named Helen Jewett. So serialized coverage is, um, is when an event generates sustained attention in the press, right? You get spin-off stories, even spin-off publications like you see here, you know, the, the trial, uh, uh, the transcript of the trial of Robinson. Um, the event becomes a matter of public debate. You get letters to the editor, you know, and, it, and the story is followed through over multiple uh, publications through to its conclusion or until a conclusion is foisted on it or forced on it. You know, maybe another event comes and overshadows the, 
the uh, event that's the occasion of the serialized coverage. Um, but readers follow the details of all of these events through one medium or through, through a range of media. And this really fosters um, competition in the press, right, to get the latest scoop. And strangely enough, right, serialized coverage was not a tendency in the press before the 1830s. Um, but the murder and the subsequent trial of, uh, of Jewett's client and also potential suitor, uh, uh, Richard P. Robinson, right, becomes the event that, um, that made serialized coverage a prominent feature in the commercial press. And so as a friend of mine likes to point out, right, behind every successful publisher, you're likely to find a dead woman. Um, or, so you've got serialized coverage, or take a development like the interview, right? This seems like a really common sense technique in reporting, right? Of course, journalists would, you, was you, would use interviews, um, but in fact, they weren't widely used or even thought to be credible until uh, William T. Stead, an English journalist, used interviews in his 1885 sensational expose called The Maiden Tribute of Modern Babylon. Um, and it, this, The Maiden Tribute was the first kind of lengthy uh, serialized expose that compared prostitution to chattel slavery. Um, it was so influential that it initiated a new phase of the social, a new sort of international global phase of the social purity movement. So you've got serialized coverage, you've got um, interviews, right? Both of these are innovations in journalism that changed journalism itself and that occur and that were pioneered really on the backs of sex workers. Um, and there are a few other ways or different ways that the periodical print media um, engaged with sex and sex workers during the period that we're focusing on. So um, the first is that the press was really a major vehicle for representing um, and depicting commercial sex and constructing it as both an object of fascination um, but also as a problem to be regulated, controlled, and surveilled, right? And newspaper stories played a major role in determining whether sex workers in cities and in towns would be viewed through the lenses of pity, the lenses of interest, of uh, pity, interest, disgust, right, or alarm. Um, and, you know, as, as many of you probably know, Right. The tendency throughout the 19th century or across the 19th century was toward establishing more control over um, sex work globally. Right. And there were various attempts to either regulate it through licensing or medical inspection or suppress it through criminalization. And by the end of the 19th century, newspapers um, played a major role in reporting from the perspective of anti-vice reformers um, and sometimes even spearheading organized campaigns against the sex industry, right? But at the same time, newspapers and print media were also vehicles for conveying sexual content, right? And, and for advertising sexual services. So through you know, uh, explicit ads or through classified ads um, or through specialized content in erotic or porn pornographic journals, the print media served as a means of announcing sexual services, right? And of bringing people together for different kinds of sex. Um, and you know, also at times as sexual objects themselves. Um, so in, uh, in New York in the 1840s, um, you find there's the rise of a subversive genre of heterosexual male sporting weeklies. Um, the, they had titles like The Rake, The Flash, and The Whip, and they focused on commercialized uh, and cheap am amusements, right? They had a lot of reviews of brothels, 
of gambling houses and sporting events. And the focus in these uh, papers were really, was really on you know, carnal pleasures. Um, they uh, pushed the boundaries of acceptable discourse. Uh, and of course, they uh, drew the ire of reformers, right? Because in part because, and other people, because they engaged in way too much libel. They even engaged in blackmail as a way to make, make money. Um, and they were a very short-lived form, but they might have, you could kind of think of them as a precursor to 20th century alternative weeklies. Um, and classified ads, of course, throughout the 19th and 20th centuries were used by individual sex workers um, and also by establishments to advertise services, often using, you know, very veiled language. Um, uh, sex workers and madams uh, created their own print media too, right? So here's an example of the Denver Red Book from 1892. And it was put together by uh, madams to advertise Denver's red light district, right? Just before a major convention happened to occur in the city. Okay, so payment. Um, payment from a historical perspective is an area that I just recently started thinking about and researching. So my analysis here is still pretty speculative. Um, but media scholars like, uh, like Lana Swartz um, have made the case that money is a form of communication that parallels other developments in media technologies. Um, and Swartz points out that of all the print media, right, paper currency bills are probably the most overlooked form. So with this in mind, I started thinking about the, uh, the brass tokens that some 19th century brothels um, used as internal currency, especially in the West. Um, so brass tokens you know, were often used on these frontier towns or where towns had cropped up around mining areas, right? Because where there was an abundance of metal. Um, and a patron would purchase a token at the window and give it to a sex worker during a session, right? Or sometimes the token would, um, would, uh, would be good for a drink, right? At a neighboring saloon or, or you know, a, a saloon that was connected to the establishment. So if paper money symbolizes value, right? If paper money equals value, then these tokens symbolize money. Um, and they were, they were good for, uh, they were exchangeable for services that were rendered within the brothels. Um, and they also served to advertise these businesses. So when you carried one of these tokens off the premises, right, the token would lose its exchange value, but it would become a durable business card right, or a memento. And according to uh, Melissa Dipmore, uh, brothel tokens functioned in part to keep workers' hands out of the till, right? Um, brothel workers would exchange them for a lump cash payment at the end of the week. And so the token system ensured that workers would stick around for a whole work week, right? They wouldn't make a bunch of money one night and then up and leave. Um, but at the same time, it also uh, protected them against being robbed by customers. And there are some other ways that I think these tokens might have functioned within, the within these 19th century establishments. Um, uh, the first is that because patrons give money to a cashier, right, the tokens create this kind of abstract value um, between the money and the service, right? Clientele wouldn't feel like the transaction was necessarily being sullied by the exchange of cash. Um, the tokens also forced customers to pay up front. So you're avoiding, you're avoiding a kind of dine and ditch situation, right? Um, and they also 
uh, mimicked the, the sentimental coins that lovers would sometimes gift to each other at the time. Um, these coins were called love tokens and, um, and they were often made by sort of defacing a, a, a coin a coin that had value, right? So you would scratch off the face of the coin and you would replace it or, you know, etch your own initials, the lover's initials or an image into the coin. And, um, and once that happened, the coin could no longer be exchanged for something else, right? And brothel tokens were a sort of intermediary um, form, right? So they had exchange value, uh, but they also exploited that same emotional, intimate, sentimental resonance that um, that uh, that that love coins had. Um, and then later in the twentieth century, you have um, you've got uh, tickets and coins that end up that are used as metering devices. And I just learned that term. I was having so much fun reading about money last week. Um, so it, when metering devices in uh, economic terms are when you, um, you know, customers pay for small units of time with a worker. Um, and so in taxi dance clubs that emerged after the, at the turn of the, uh, tw of the 20th century, um, each ticket was good. Men would pay to dance, usually with young women, and um, and each ticket was good for one dance, and then or for the length of a song, right? And so taxi dancing got its name because, right, like taxis, you paid for the minute. And then later, you know, peep shows also used tokens to meter out segments of time, and then today. Um, virtual anonymized online tokens are often used as a medium of exchange in many webcamming sites. Um, so tokens in these larger, let me check my time. Okay. Yikes, I'm gonna skip ahead. Um, I wanna wrap up by just very quickly looking at depictions of technology and sex work in uh, two white slavery films that were very popular. They both came out in 1913. Um, and the emphasis, I mean, both of these silent films are essentially cautionary tales of technology that reveal a deep fascination with the methods that alleged trafficking rings use to ensnare their unwitting victims. And so the emphasis in both of these films is on, you know, pimping and brothel keeping and nefarious economic exchanges. Um, the traffic in souls follows this large scale hierarchically organized trafficking ring that uses cutting edge technology like dictographs, you know, Model Ts, telephones, trains to manage an army of cadets or pimps. And traffickers use these sophisticated technologies to transmit instant messages to each other, right? And they're able to outwit civil servants until the print media steps in and galvanizes the public and, um, you know, against what was called at the time white slavery or, you know, the, the traffic in white women. Um, there's my, I'll wrap it up really quick. Uh, and uh, similarly, inside the, in the inside of the white slave traffic um, uh, depicts this elaborate trafficking ring with a nationwide uh, surveillance system, right? And this is a fiction that ends up
Oh, sorry about that. Um, I was actually just texting to ask if that was uh, uh, mine or uh, someone else's. Um, okay, so um, it sounds like Gretchen might be having um, some challenges uh, with um, Wi-Fi. And so while we wait for her to hop back on, um, we are going to switch to a uh, question and answer period for the next um, 26 minutes or so. Um, and hopefully Gretchen can come back and join us. Um, and so um, we will start with you, May. I'll put you on the spot. Um, the questions and answers. Um, and so, you know, you have both talked about um, so many things that are really resonant and and that was really starting to come up in the chat as well about like how these things are still manifesting, how these ideas are still manifesting in our lives. You talked about, you know, the trafficking narrative, you talked about white saviorism and how racialized that is. Um, uh, you talked about, you know, these conceptualizations of racial, re the, the fetishization and racialization specifically around Asian women, the construct of families and how that's changed through immigration regulations. Um, and I'm curious, and you touched on this in, in your uh, presentation, I would love to hear your thoughts on how, you know, looking at this historical trajectory, how you are seeing it manifest and you know what is what is most um pressing and most resonant for you as you're looking at you know this um longer historical landscape than than is often really um discussed or covered in these conversations great um of course the first thing is you know owing to critical resistance language we now understand that it's not that these systems are malfunctioning, but it's designed as such. And I think acknowledging that is a great place to start. It's not like we need um, immigration reform. Yes, it needs to be changed. But but I mean, so I am actually, I, I'm an immigrant. I'm here on a work visa and I'm currently going through um, a, disa a disastrous sort of um, uh, time with USCIS. And what's really striking is Erica Liesman talked about this in her great book about the construction of um, Asian Americans and xenophobia specifically. But um, the US Immigration Services actually very recently changed their mandate from um, you know, helping people come to America to protecting America and Americans from external influence. And that shift is obviously very worrisome. And also maybe it might help us to just be honest about the fact that America is racist. <laughs> and as such, its immigration policy is supposed to be racist. And it's amazing. I'm currently going through this. Um, I have to fill in this like, Q&A questionnaire uh, to even apply for a green card. And an entire page. And, and so then you go through the questions and it's questions like, you know, have you ever committed crimes against humanity? Have you ever committed genocide? Have you ever, have you ever, and there's this entire section of like, have you ever um, uh, engaged in prostitution? Have you ever been paid for sexual services? And it's just like reams and reams of these questions. And um, it pains me to have to go through them. But I think, again, just acknowledging the fact that America is racist and uh, horrific and all those things and that it is in our um, uh, very makeup, I think is a good and honest place to begin the conversation. And that's so fascinating about how, um, you know, especially that, that narrative of protection and of wanting to protect, you know, this construct of America um, and to view it really through that lens and um, how much that lens, I think, is really naturalized um, as opposed to recognizing that like those, that approach of it is actually a choice that we made. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks like Gretchen is back. Uh, I'm so sorry. I, <laughs> I just, uh, my computer dumped me right mid sentence. Um, no worries. Uh, and we were just uh, kind of shifting into Q&A, but um, I would love for you to kind of just wrap up or uh, if, if that's where you were um, to wrap up your presentation. And would you like me to pop off the screen share for you again or? Um, sure. Or I could just wrap up without, and maybe, in just in case that was what pushed my computer over the edge. <laughs> Let's let me just go ahead and wrap up without the the slide. Um, 
so I were, oh, I was talking about how the, the, in these early white slavery, these silent films, um, you know, they depicted these very tech savvy traffickers. And, and I think I was saying that that was, you know, that that fiction of the tech savvy trafficker then becomes um, the justification, right? For the expansion of local and national police forces. Um, and, uh, and, you know, but these are representations that you can continue to see into the present day. Um, so sex workers are, you know, very rarely seen as being early adapters or even using technologies themselves, right? So you've got this fear of women and femmes using technology, fear of them communicating, right? But we all know that sex workers communicate and they communicate a lot. Um, and you know, what gets lost in these narratives is that sex workers are, innova are innovators in communication um, because they're entrepreneurs. And sex work affords, afforded one of the earliest spaces for women's entrepreneurial activities, right? The activities that were curtailed other, other, in other areas. And so it was, can open space, you know, for some at first until they were systematically excluded, like with Atoy, right? Until they were systematically excluded from it through the actions of local anti-vice groups, missionaries, and the police, right? But the irony in these representations is that they, uh, you know, depict technology as exploiting women and sex workers, when in fact, sex workers have always been active users in the tools of commerce and communication, and they've used those devices to evade detection, right? To ensure their safety, to get paid, to advertise, and so forth. And that was about, and I'll end there. <laughs> Um, well, that actually is a, a, a beautiful um, kind of building. And uh, first and foremost, just gratitude for both of you for your presentations. Um, I, I, fascinating, absolutely. That's like a personal nerd on this kind of stuff. Absolutely, incredibly um, interesting. Um, and and that actually, you know, what you're just saying about like this creation of the the um, the creation of the victimizer, the creation of the other. Um, I think builds so beautifully on kind of what May was saying about immigration and how we're constructing these ideas of who is and then how they utilize technology. And, you know, during the pandemic, I know it came up that like, how do you avoid trafficking? You keep your kids off Instagram um, because they're using these new mediums. And uh, before uh, we go to other questions, I was um, I'm curious if you had questions for each other. And, you know, you guys talked about such complimentary things. Um, and such similar spaces. And I also didn't realize until I was reading through your bios where I was like, oh, we have two people who, uh, we have a, a journalist and an academic who talks about journalism in conversation with each other. And so much of this is about media narrative too and the persistence of it. So I was wondering if you had questions for each other first and foremost. I have a question for Gretchen. I read her excellent book, I have a copy of here. And um, I, yeah, I mean, every other page is like dog-eared and there's a lot of marginalia. And the question that I came, kept coming back to reading it was just a simple one, which is why has this narrative endured? Why, why do we see a, keep, you know, 1800s progressive era now, why? Um, well, I, you know, I think that there are a few reasons that it's endured, but one of course is migration. So you tend to see trafficking narratives and, you know, real trafficking um, occur during periods where there's a lot of movement of people. And so, um, you know, if you, if you think of, about the United States and the period when tight immigration laws were put into place, um, there was less just talk, at least domestically, about trafficking. And then, you know, in, in the early 1990s, after, uh, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, 
and this new sort of people were talking about this new period of globalization, right? That's when we started in the US to see trafficking narratives resurface. And it was really, for I think that, you know, even though uh, anti-trafficking activists and sex workers, activists are trying to find some common ground now, I think that, that on the whole, um, that trafficking narratives often have the function of, uh, you know, silencing and muzzling um, and even dehumanizing, I would argue, um, sex workers. And so in the 1990s, when I first started thinking about these things, you know, sex workers, rights activists were starting to make some inroads on the kind of national scene. And part of that was around their emphasis on harm reduction. And so I had one friend who had this really great business card, sex worker. And, you know, on one side, the business card had her, you know, in a kind of sexy repose, just looking really beautiful and seductive. And then on the other side, she offered her services for, um, uh, you know, uh, as an HIV AIDS counselor and safe sex expert, right? And um, you started to see more sex worker activists on national news. And then the trafficking narrative kind of resurfaced. Um, and those voices were silenced on, you know, on television and, and so forth. Um, so I think so much of it has to do with immigration and, and the movement of people. Um, and uh, May, so I'm, I'm just so struck by your work. I think that um, it's, you're a beautiful writer and that you're telling stories that, that need to be told. Um, and um, you're part of sort of an emerging movement of journalists who really delve into the past, right? Now, now I think increasingly journalists are starting to do historical work, right? And to find that one in this new kind of informational context, one function that they can serve is to provide historical context. And I think that's really great. Um, and I'm, I guess I'm wondering uh, how, but maybe it's not a question so much as just I'm pointing out that you're doing this very important work of um, showing how racial hierarchies operate and have operated within sex work. And you know, one of the things that you do so nicely in the Atoy piece is that you show that you know, the white sex workers um, thrived in part at the expense of some of the Asian sex workers whose uh, activities were being suppressed. And I was wondering if you see a similar dynamic today. There's the question part of it. Oh, completely. Um, yeah, I think most sex, you know, working sex workers know that racial hierarchies exist and it's, it's sort of, um, uh, assume you know it's 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 unquest it goes unquestioned that you know black sex workers maybe get paid less than than if you're this like platonic ideal um by certain standards you know really I, I think it is it's all about norms and we have this platonic ideal of you know what constitutes a, a an idealized woman and usually in a lot of Americans imagination it's probably you know blonde hair blue eyed and then anyone who approximates that per, you know platonic ideal can you know charge a premium and sex workers I've spoken with um, for my research like we've joked about how you know they've said that you know it, the the white girl can be like you know I don't know heavily you know have you know heavy drug user and maybe she hasn't showered in a fortnight and is like not actually appealing but that she can still charge extras and then you know all the rest of us are you know doing everything we can to sort of approximate whiteness but so, so yeah so that that happens a lot and, and this is part of something that I haven't quite figured out you know I don't have good analysis for it but I'm also rather shocked by like why is it that even people who um, have this sort of public facing versions of themselves as being woke or liberal or le even leftist and then in their private lives have maybe you know problematic ways of engaging in sex and 
you know, I, I, I encountered this in like lap dance lounges where um, I am like immediately orientalized and it, there's just no escape. And um, I don't really know why. And maybe it's just that like sexual desires and inclinations you just can't lie. Like maybe other things you can sort of, you know, fake your way through, but how we really feel inside all the, um, like the, 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 yeah, the naked sentiment that's very difficult to mask. And that sort of um, very uncomfortable part of ourselves is the part of ourselves that's been socially constructed over time. And maybe arguably like is most reflective of their, you know, the racism and the horophobia and everything um, that, you know, we live with. Thank you. Yeah, there's so much food for thought there and, and um, you know, navigating public space and private space and navigating our, our work lives and um, our <coughs> uh, uh, public personas and who those are, are going out to. Um, and I know that uh, if folks are um, going to be watching the next, uh, uh, the rest of the series, a lot of what we're also trying to do is really build on each other. And I, I already know places where that conversation about having a public persona, having a public persona in sex work on social media, and then having a, a personal life how to navigate those. And so it's so interesting um, that it's already kind of coming up in conversation. Um, and so, uh, Gretchen, the question that I asked uh, May was, you know, um, you guys have been pulling out these themes and uh, already talking about, you know, the question of payment processors is one we're still talking about today. And so of the stuff that, that you have done that kind of work around, um, what do you see as kind of moving forward and most resonant uh, or, or uh that is landing for you when you read about the early stuff and you're like, oh, wow. So apparently that's 150 years old. Um, when you kind of do that historical trajectory, especially, you know, in the, con in the current context of all of these conversations around tech and, and, and uh, sex. Um, oh, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I, I think that one, I think it's just really important that we're having this discussion about sex workers use of technology because that's such an underexplored area right and that's one area where um, increasingly sex workers have started to assert their own um, dexterity their own adroitness <laughs> um, but you know it's it's also been this because so much of the history is written by reformers um, so much of what we know about sex work um, is because they, you know, they took the notes, they saved the receipts, they um, they wrote lavish uh, reports on what they what on the results of their investigations, and sex workers weren't as actively chronicling what they did, right? Because they were engaged in, you know, often a form of commerce or just impromptu. Um, sexual exchanges. And so I think that it's that the more we start researching um, the past from the perspective of what sex workers were doing, how they were innovating, um, the more we'll see these connections between um, the past and, and today. I love that line that history was written by the reformers. Um, and I think that that is a sentiment that I'm certainly going to carry forward. Um, so uh, just want to give a minute. Do we have uh, questions from folks? We might. I think we have time for one or two um, about uh, sex work and technology and kind of this this historical perspective. Um, and if you want to place those in the chat, and just to uh, give everyone a minute, I do have some pocket questions. Um, I was wondering, is there anything, you guys talked about stuff that is so cool um, and so fascinating and so um, just like, you know, those sweet little moments, I think are some of the things that like bind us together on uh, sex work. I was having a separate text with someone who was like, oh my God, they used to use business cards too. Um, is there, what is your favorite like court little, cute little quirky moment um, in your historical research that you came across? 
it's quirky necessarily, but I've been thinking a lot about uh, the horophobia that exists in the Asian community and what to do about that. It's sort of uh, top of mind now, you know, after the Atlanta massacre. And I, in in my readings, I realized, and also just sort of going back in my uh, my own memory, I, I realized that um, it it's not always been this way. And so actually, so I'm I'm a I'm Korean and. Um, there's this long tradition of they're called kisings, which are basically Korean geishas. And, you know, there are very famous kisings in Korean history who are heralded as like national heroes because they, you know, there's like one famous kising who like, um, like secretly like poisoned like a Japanese general who was like, you know, trying to colonize the peninsula and, you know, like we love her and there are like a bunch of other people as well. And as well, there's a, a rather famous case, I think in the nineties called Yugen Mi, who was a um, Camtown prostitute or I think she, she's a bar girl and she was brutally murdered. And she is actually what sparked the, um, anti-US, you know, get these American bases off the Korean Peninsula movement. A lot of the organizing actually coalesced around that. And so in that instance, actually, like the anti-colonial rage um, uh, trumped whatever horophobia that existed. And I think I've been doing personal work in sort of, you know, really get, you know, become, being proud of that legacy, that that is what, where I come from. And actually a lot of attentions that exist today, like, you know, to, to, to realize that it's not always been that way gives one hope that it will, it can also change. Um, in my research, I'm trying to think of quirky moments. Um, <laughs> well, you know, there are these moments where, um, you find sex workers talking back to reformers and then, you know, and then reformers getting bristling about it <laughs> and then writing about it, right? So um, I, I remember, and I have this in the book somewhere, but um, a reformer went to see one of these uh, white slavery brothel exploitation films. And of course, reformers were very worried about theaters themselves, right, as spaces of, um, hetero social mixing. And um, a reformer overheard some uh, other, uh, you know, members of the audience, presumably sex workers saying, well, now I'm a tinky winky white slavey. You know, they were, they were kind of poking fun of- Oh, it's come off in a different part. Uh, because, it was, because it was so over the top and, you know, and, and exaggerated. That is so fantastic. <laughs> um, and then uh, it looks like we have one uh, more question. Is there a history of monetary exchange technologies evolving in response to surveillance or tracking of payments? Yes. Um, so uh, the, the scholar that I mentioned, Lana Swartz, um, has a book called New Money that, um, that traces some of that history um, so that would be a good place to start. And it has a pretty extensive bibliography too. So then you could go back and, and find some of these other histories, uh, find some of the other work that's been done on, um, on money as a technology. Um, I also have a, um, I should, the book should be coming out pretty soon, but I have a former grad student named Ashley Cordes who does work on indigenous currency. Um, and is writing some of that history as well, but her, and has a couple of standalone articles, but her name is Ashley Cordes, and I'll just put it in the chat. Uh, we will certainly track that down, and that's definitely going to be a conversation that comes up. Um, in some of the later ones, uh, or some of the uh, later conversations we're going to be having really specifically about money, um, and and answering that question of what happens when money is becoming increasingly surveilled, um, which is uh, certainly going to be a, a growing conversation. 
um, uh, over the next year in Congress and has been for the last couple of years, especially. Um, and so we're at 129. We're not done, but um, just to wrap up the slide portion, um, and we, we do have another uh, question that might be a little specific, so we can, we can try to uh, triage that one. Um, but we do have resources that are going to be made available. So here's a mixture of uh, the first one is the article from Atoy uh, about Atoy that May wrote, which is actually it. Uh, it gave me one of the most beautiful Sunday mornings um, just to read this article. So I very much encourage uh, folks to um, really enjoy this beautiful narrative and this beautiful story. Um, uh, the next one uh, is, uh, again, talking about the Atlanta shootings and moving up. The first book on this list is uh, Gretchen's incredible book. It's fascinating. It moves really fast. Um, it's a really accessible piece that talks about how journalism really shaped um, so much of how we talked about trafficking, and especially in the context of how journalism and capitalism have become so deeply married um, with each other. I think it, it illuminates a lot of narrative conversations that are so alive today. Um, and then we have a couple uh, videos, um, a, a couple of videos that are pretty short, they're pretty accessible, um, as well as two books really specific. Uh, I actually just bought Haunting the Korean Diaspora um, that are really specific to uh, Asian migration context around sexuality. Um, next week, next Friday, uh, we are going to be moving a little bit forward in history, um, and we're going to be talking about magazines, we're going to be talking about the mail, and, uh, and we're going to be talking about obscenity and how obscenity laws and our understandings of pornography uh, and, and the enforcement of obscenity laws have really been shaped by this. We're bringing two awesome uh, speakers, a thought scholar, if you follow uh, them on Twitter, and then Stephanie Kaler, who runs the Sex Worker Archival Project, are going to be talking about some of their work around this. Um, and I'm really excited to be building on this. Um, and so now with that, uh, we are going to be shifting and